Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to welcome you on behalf of an excellent faculty. You know, when you reach a certain age and maturity, you are invited to talk about the future of endoscopy. So there are a lot of uh, very exciting uh, diagnostic, but also therapeutic aspects. And naturally, we are starting with the upper GI tract. And this is a warm welcome to Jacques Bergman from Amsterdam to talk about upper GI endoscopy, the future. Thank you, Thomas. My task today is to update you on new technical advances in upper GI endoscopy. Here are my disclosures. So I'm going to use this slide as a kind of backbone slide during my talk. It shows you the imaging chain in high quality endoscopy, starting with a light source, emitting light through the endoscope onto the mucosa, through the optics of the endoscope and your light sensor into an image processor that then depicts a high quality image. And with the X1 system, it comes with a 32 inch 4K monitor for really high quality white light endoscopy. Now the first significant change over the last years is relates to the light source. Over the last decades, endoscopic systems have relied on a xenon lamp for illumination. And this is a very effective way if it comes to creating light that resembles daylight and creates a broad spectrum, which is in the range of visible light. The problem with a xenon lamp is, however, it's highly inefficient. You have to put a lot of energy in the lamp to get optical energy out of that. And the durability of the lamp is pretty limited. You usually have to replace them after 400 to 500 hours. And then again, it, it has a restricted spectrum to the visible um, light range. The newer endoscopy systems are using LEDs. And these are much smaller, they are compact, relatively inexpensive, and they have an impressive durability. They have a lifetime of up to 50,000 hours. So that's a hundredfold of what you are used to with your xenon lamp. Um, and it also has several optical advantages. Even with white light images, these LED light source creates a light that, especially in the short distance, four or five centimeter distance from the tip of the endoscope, the white light image has a much more stable properties to it. There's less flickering, a sharper shadowing, and it enables us to create an illumination even outside the visible light range. So one of the biggest changes has been around for quite some time is that we're changing the illumination light to illuminate combined with LEDs and filters, largely in the green and blue spectrum for narrow band imaging. And the reason for that is that blue light and green light have a much shorter wavelength. And that causes the light to penetrate much more superficially into the mucosa, causing less scattering and really depicting the mucosal patterns in the very superficial layers. An additional advantage is that this blue and green light are exactly within the hemoglobin absorption uh, wavelengths. So that blood vessels are very accurately depicted if you're using blue and green light for illumination. So here's an example of a high quality white light with the new system. And this is the corresponding image with MBI. And please note that a lot of the images that I will be showing have been kindly provided by Stefan Zewald, who was the luckiest endoscopist in Europe because he was the first to get his hands on the system. Here is an example of a corresponding video with white light and with MBI. You can see that if you compare this area here 
compared to here that the mucosal pattern is better observed with MBI. And this area here where you can see the vascular pattern is probably better depicted in MBI than with white light. Now the setup of using multiple LEDs and changing the illumination also enables us to use a new type of optical chromoscopy, RDI. And RDI stands for red dichromatic imaging. The standard setup of if you use LEDs to create a good quality white light uses four LEDs, violet, blue, green, and red. But for the purpose of RDI, the system has been expanded to include an amber illumination LED. And the reason for this has to do with the imaging of blood. So here's a graphic showing you the mucosa covered with diluted blood. So why is blood red? Well, the reason for that is that the green light is largely absorbed by the blood, whereas the red light is reflected. Now, why does everything turn red when it bleeds during endoscopy? The reason for that is that the absorption of green light and reflection of red light are hardly influenced by blood concentration. So your bleeding source is red, but even the areas where the blood is diluted appear almost just as red. Adding the amber changes this. For amber, the absorption is highly dependent on the blood concentration. So if there's little blood, most of the amber is reflected, but at the area where the bleeding is most prominent and the blood concentration is highest, here most of the amber light is being absorbed. So that allows us to selectively see where the bleeding comes from. Here is a duet case. After resection, there's redness here, there's bleeding. And the corresponding RDI image actually shows you the highest concentration of blood. Here is where the bleeding site is. And this is an example of Stefan Zebel then doing an ESD and he's going to cut a vessel, not on purpose, but everything turns red. So remove your knife, get your coa grasper, compress it with a cap, flush, it still is not completely clear where the bleeding comes from. And then you switch to your RDI. And this allows you to selectively see at least better than if you would be in white light where the bleeding comes from. Then to apply your coa grasper on the right spot, closing it and then coagulating it actually under RDI before you switch back to white light and to see that you actually have dealt with the bleeding. So the advantage of this optical chromoscopy technique is that whereas NBI is very well known for characterization, this new optical chromoscopy technique, RDI, may make life easier for endoscopists during treatment, which is new and quite innovative actually. So back to the imaging chain, we talked about LEDs and optical chromoscopy. Now there's also a significant change in the X1 system that relates to the optics. It's called EDOF, whereas EDOF stands for extended depth of field. It's actually a system that creates the best of your dual focus optical system in your endoscope. It takes the light that passes through your optical system and then splits it into two images that are identical, but since they have a slightly different focal length, have a different focus, as you can see here. So one of them has the far focus image, the, the far field is in focus, whereas the periphery is less in focus, and the other image, which had a different focal length, has the other way around. It has a good focal distance nearby, and it's out of focus in a distance. And what EDOF does is that it takes the best of these two images, then overlies them, and presents that to you during your endoscopy. 
So here is how this looks in real time. The image on the left hand side is being recorded with the currently available uh, Xera 3 system 190 scopes and the right one is with an EDOT scope. And you can see that the image here is completely in focus, whereas areas here are less in focus compared to here. The final step I want to discuss in the imaging chain is the improved image processing. It's the image that actually gets back from your CMOS and is that then in the computer is transformed by improving color, improving texture and improving brightness. Of course, we need a fancy name for this. So this one's called TXI, texture and color enhancing imaging. And this is how it then looks in real time. So this is your high quality white light imaging. And if you switch on your endoscope to TXI, this is then how it looks. So this image compared to white light has a better texture, a better brightness, and some better change in color tone. It's a post-processing technique that takes your white light image input, then splits this into an image that reflects the texture that then can be improved and an image that reflects the basal brightness in which you would improve areas that are not optimally bright. And then you overlay these two images to get, in this case, a TXI mode two, which has improved texture and improved brightness. Look at the difference between what you can see here and what you can see here. There's dark areas here that are improved, whereas the adequately illuminated areas are not affected. And there is improved texturing. And then you can add a third post-processing uh, improvement in TXI one in which we take the color and improve the color spectrum. So most of what we do during endoscopy is against a reddish background. We're trying to find neoplasia in Barrett's or in the stomach or in the colon. And the background color is in the white to red spectrum. So this color enhancement basically makes everything that is white look more whitish and everything that is red look more reddish. So basically we were stretching out the white to red spectrum and that should improve uh, imaging. So here is then how it looks on a video. The left-hand side is your high quality white light imaging and your right-hand side is the TXI mode, the post-processing mode in which you can appreciate better texture, in which you can appreciate better brightness and in which you can appreciate better color. Another video, again, white light on the left, TXI on the right. The image looks quite similar. Still, there's much more information in the TXI mode than in the white light mode because brightness, color, and texture have all been improved. Now this is new. So the true clinical benefits of TXI are largely theoretical, but logically since brightness, color and texture are improved, visibility of lesions should be improved. And as a consequence, miss rates uh, should go down and delineation, at least an overview should become easier. For me, it's very important that this new modality is very close to white light endoscopy, which makes it for endoscopists who are entering into a new modality, that there is some background reference where they can relate to, which will, from my perspective, make the take up of a technology like this easier and quicker. So I've shown you the different steps of this imaging chain, all with significant improvements. The question now is within this chain, what's now the weakest link? And the bad news is 
it's not longer in the endoscopy system. It's the one that's holding the endoscope. It's you and me. Because basically everything you need to see is there. There's hardly any room for improval to, to visualize lesions. Yet if these lesions are very subtle, they can be seen, but only if you recognize them as such. So here is an early cancer and it's different from this area because of the vascular pattern, because of the texture and because of the color, yet they're still very subtle. No imaging technology will make things that are subtle appear more different because subtlety is just the intrinsic part of the lesion. So what we will be needing is not make the image look better, but how do we interpret images? And this is where artificial intelligence will kick in. It will tell us where in these six images the Barrett's cancer are just by highlighting a crosshair like this or a red flag, allowing you to switch to TXI, to NBI, and to do a more closer inspection. In my opinion, artificial intelligence is the true future of endoscopic technology advancement. It will help us not only by detecting what can be seen, but may not necessarily be recognized like early Barrett's cancer, early gastric cancer. It's difficult to visualize sessile serrated adenomas. But it will also help us to characterize lesions. If we switch to NBI, it will tell us this is a polyp that you can resect and discard, or this is an area that you should not even biopsy because it's non-displastic. In my opinion, it will also help us if we look at lesions that we don't understand. If we see a strange ulcer in the gastric fundus where we rarely encounter ulcers, the system may, may show us 15 examples of ulcers in the gastric fundus with a differential diagnosis telling you that you might want to take biopsies for lymphoma or for gastric syphilis. And that if you take these biopsies, you should put them in a special medium because a standard formalin biopsy may not get you that diagnosis. But maybe the, the biggest impact of AI may be that it will not help the endoscopist to interpret, but it may help the endoscopist to do a better job there will be like a big brother is watching you on your shoulder, telling you when you're doing a lousy job, when your pullback from the cecum is too fast, when you've missed a bend, if you, where is you, you've not cleaned the colon, where you've missed the dorsal part of the gastric fundus, all of this will likely feed back into quality indicators that are being done real time, recorded real time and being fed back to you so that you do a better job. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Thomas. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to... Okay, thank you very much, Shaq. So you started with a simple explanation and ended up with an almost philosophical horizon. So maybe we can uh, structure the questions accordingly. So with, with the new system, there is uh, one feature I think everybody understands, which is EDOF, meaning that um, you have a better view at the, in the near field than the far field. So that's, you know, if you get used to that, uh, usually what happens if you work with the old, uh, older generation, then they, the picture looks more blurry. So that's, that's one step forward, very simple one. But then we have uh, other features like T TXI. So when switching between the two, it's a kind of different image. So what do you do in your daily practice? You always use both or do you think you will go for one finally in the upper GI tract? I think this TXI basically is a, a, at least theoretically, it's an improved version of your white light image. It has better brightness, it has better texture, uh, and it also gives you a wider range in the white to red spectrum. So basically it helps our human eyes to better observe what's there against this white light background that we're used to. 
So it's for me, it's when I when I try this, I often find myself actually that I've switched to TXI and I've that I've not switched back to white light, that I've continued doing my what I at that time think is white light endoscopy, that I'm actually continuing this white light endoscopy in the TXI mode. Uh, and when I find out and then I switch back to white light, then actually I see what I lose. And then usually I switch back to TXI. So this is a post-processing technique that really relates to what we are used to as endoscopists from a white light endoscopy perspective. But many endoscopists who are now in the, and this is all in the early stages because the technology has just very recently come out. But many endoscopists that I speak to, they, they, they say the same thing that they've actually, they moved to TXI without actually noticing it. And other endoscopy systems, for instance, the Pentax system, which also has an enhancement mode on that. Again, you get the same feedback from endoscopists that they actually switch to this improved post-processing technique as the, as the newer version of doing white light endoscopy. It's all conceptual. There's no proof to this, but there's a good concept that underlies this. So basically, you think it's a courtesy of Olympus that they left us their own system, but the prediction is that most people, you know, we, we, most people don't have so much time, maybe for Barrett's, but not for colonoscopy or the stomach or so. So your prediction is that TXI will take over eventually. Yeah, the endoscopists will find their own preference for that, but in the end, your eye will adapt to what your eye will appreciate as the image with the best quality, appreciated quality. And it may very well be that that will be the TXI2 mode. There again, there's a second mode in which the color is, and is, is stretched and everything that's white looks a little bit more whitish and everything that red is look, looks a little bit more reddish. That mode is a little bit further away from our white light endoscopy appreciation. Um, so I'm not so sure if we will adapt to, to that TXI mode but the, the improved brightness and texture with TXI2 is, uh, for me, a more logical standard imaging mode than the old or current white light endoscopy mode. Okay, I, I, I see the point. Um, then uh, RDI, the red dichromatic imaging, um, it, it's meant to see vessels which are a little bit deeper, A and B, um, uh, it, it might help in uh, bleeding of uh, moderate intensity. So what's, what's your practical experience here in, in, in both areas, imaging and bleeding management? It's, uh, it's fairly limited um, for a couple of reasons. First, again, it all has to do with, uh, with your background, attitude and approach that you have, in this case for bleeding. So if most of the bleedings I encounter is after endoscopic resections or during ESDs, in which I, if I have the view onto where the bleeding spot is, then I just can tackle that and usually treat that with a with a cover grasper. Um, so, pushing with a cap, flushing with water, under normal circumstances, bails me out anyway. Uh, this RDI mode is simply at least conceptually a better mode to see the bleeding spores because it it has the it has the the, the, the area with the highest concentration will show its face and that especially pays off in situations where you cannot flush away the blood where the bleeding is for instance at the six o'clock position and where the bleeding side basically pools in the diluted pool of blood and this is where in circumstance where compressing with a cap or flushing with water is much less of an escape. And then this optical trick really can help you to at least target an area where you can then position your scope. And maybe then again, do your flushing and compression and et cetera, but it will still help you better and quicker to find an area where the blood comes from. Interesting that some of the, the, the background studies that have been done also show that endoscopists become less stressed if they are looking at an RDI image then, and an image which is completely red. 
Um, now, I'm not so sure of that. If, if stress reduction is the main aim, I would rather go for quality and effectiveness in, in, in managing the bleed and not as much the stress level of the endoscopist. But again, the theoretical background of this is logical. Uh, we have to see how this pays off in a more prospective number of, of series that we need. Okay, thank you. There, uh, one step back, there was a question uh, uh, coming in. Uh, TXI in combination with chromoendoscopy. How does this work? Um, well, there's nothing against doing it, but most of what your endoscope provides you now is what chromoendoscopy also gives you. Uh, and the advantage of an optical chromoscopy technique like TXI and MBI is that it gives you both the mucosal and the vascular inflammation. And most of your chromoscopy technique, like in Diego Carmine or methylene blue or acetic acid, they actually boost the mucosal pattern, but they basically cover your vascular pattern. So for me, I've really moved away from most of the upper GI early neoplasia work that I'm doing. I really moved away from using any uh, chromoscopy techniques with, with the use of dyes. And I really restrict myself to the combination of especially NBI or BLI if we use Fujiscopes. Mm -hmm. uh, and in this case, I do think TXI is a logical background modality to start off the overview imaging with. Okay, that was an important message. So the last dye standing might be acetic acid. Uh, does this have a role? Blue is gone, you say, but even uh, even acetic acid is uh, is it is it uh, additive in this uh, with the uh, with the new scopes? Uh, we have no data. My personal opinion is that it does not have additive value. I think there's a lot of studies that really uh, done well studies on MBI and actually show that MBI does not improve primary detection, it improves characterization. Probably the same thing for uh, using acetic acid. Uh, show me better studies, but for the time being, I'll stick to what my endoscopes give, gives me and not what comes from a syringe. Okay, thank you. We have maybe time for a final philosophical question. You know, with every new generation, we, we keep hearing that, okay, the image resolution gets better and better, but the human brain can't, can't cope with it, or the human eye or whatsoever. So, but still we see a better image. So when, when is, is, the, is it now the, the place that AI takes over? Because obviously AI can take improvements up to, obviously, indefinite. Yeah, it becomes more a matter of recognizing what is already visible on screen. And even with the, with the previous systems, the white light imaging and combined with MBI is already so good that really the vast majority of early neoplastic lesions that should be detected can actually be seen on the screen. It's just a matter of recognizing this. And this is, so any improvement to make subtlety look better will not likely increase diagnostics if this recognition part of the endoscopist, which is now really the rate limiting factor, if that factor is not eliminated. But that's actually a factor that with current technology and computer assisted detection, helping endoscopists to recognize what is visible on the screen is now a more logical step than trying to make this endoscopic image look even better. Okay, Sack, thank you very much. I think we will have time to discuss uh, the AI implications at the end. We now move to the uh, lower GI team. And uh, also here we have two uh, splendid speakers. It's uh, first of all, like we had Mr. Barrett's. We now have Mr. Colon from London, uh, Brian Saunders. And uh, he will speak about the future of endoscopy. And he's then followed by Alejandro Sosa from Olympus, uh, who focuses on AI. Brian, the stage is yours. So thank you, Thomas. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to give this talk on the future of lower GI endoscopy. Uh, my thanks to Olympus for, for the opportunity. It's a big subject, so it would be very difficult to cover all aspects, but I'm going to concentrate on the important aspects of polyp detection and also some thoughts about complex polyp management. These are my disclosures. 
to start off, just to give you an overview, this is a timeline of lower GI, end, GI, GI endoscopy, and it's been around now for over 50 years. In the early stages, the feasibility uh, time, there was the early development of colonoscopy, the technical feasibility, the basic tools to perform polypectomy and to examine the colon were developed. And then as we go through 2000 on to 2020, we see a rapid increase in cases, mainly driven by colorectal cancer screening. With screening came this emphasis on quality, which is rightly so. And here we are in 2020 in the drop of COVID-19, understandable, but I hopefully we will recover fairly quickly um, and get back up to levels um, that we were pre-COVID. I, I think that the um, level of activity will actually plateau at this stage because one of the things that we've learned from COVID is that colonoscopy is a very precious resource. and We need to be much more focused in terms of how we deliver it, uh, who gets a colonoscopy. Um, we're aware of the expense involved and the need to recycle and to be economical with our equipment, so-called green endoscopy. And inevitably, as non-invasive tests such as FIT testing come in, there'll be a transition in colonoscopy from diagnostic to more therapeutic work. Um, we're in the era really of efficiency of colonoscopy when we not only want quality, but we also want to be effective in delivering colonoscopy to maximize cancer prevention. And I'm sure, um, as we'll hear later on, artificial intelligence is going to underline a lot of what we do and guide what we do going forward. So here we are in 2020, there's uh, me in full PPE in the room, enjoying using the EVIS X1 system. And as we've heard from Jacques, um, tremendous uh, therapeutic and uh, diagnostic capability uh, with the new LED light source and the advanced processor, giving us increased definition of the mucosal surface and crypt structure. This is an early cancer within ulcerative colitis uh, diagnosed using the system. Colonoscopy today is different to how it has been previously in that we have professional colonoscopists. We're regulated and monitored. Colonoscopy is a big part of our, of our job plan, and hopefully we do it to a very high standard. And the key performance indicator that's come through in the last um, 10 years, really, is the adenoma detection rate or the ability uh, to pick, pick up uh, an adenoma, uh, at least one adenoma per patient. Um, and of course, finding polyps can be, still be extremely challenging, even with all the modern technology and the advanced imaging. We still have to manipulate the endoscope to allow us to see the polyp, identify it and, and remove it. And the, the human colon is a challenging environment because of its length, uh, because of its complexity and all those horstral folds. And we've known for a long time that it's very easy to miss polyps, particularly behind folds or subtle lesions such as cess ulcerated polyps or flat adenomas. Um, people often say, is it important to remove all small polyps? Well, the answer is yes. And, and this is new data, which I think is very, very important because it, it shows that uh, higher performing operators with higher ADRs prevent cancer in the long term. This is data from the flexible sigmoidoscopy trial in the UK, where over 40,000 patients were, were screened by a one-off flexible sigmoidoscopy around about the age of 60 years. And these patients have now been followed up for a median of 17 years. So we know the cancer instance, and we can look back um, at the original procedures and look at um, whether the procedure was done by a high detector, an intermediate detector, or a low detector. And when you look at the cumulative distal colorectal cancer incidence, there is clear separation uh, between the high detectors and the low detectors. So the quality of that one examination determined the risk of cancer long term. This is really unique and very important data. Put another way, the high detectors needed to perform 78 flexible sigmoidoscopies to prevent one cancer. The low detectors, nearly twice as many flexible sigmoidoscopies. And the number needed to screen to prevent one colorectal cancer death, again in the high detectors, 226 flexi-sigs, 
the low detectors many more 349 so the quality of what we do and the ability to find those polyps is important and that's where the endocuff comes in I, I, there have been a lot of uh, technological developments enabling polyp detection but the the single most important, I think, is the endocuff. It's a unique um, device because it fits on the tip of the endoscope and has these eight arms which um, have a, a, an articulation which allow them to gently move forward during withdrawal to open out the folds. And then during insertion, they fold back on the endoscope to allow um, straightforward insertion. It's simple. And, if, and, and an effective device. It's effective both during insertion and withdrawal. And what I've found is that it facilitates steering through the sigmoid, particularly using an underwater technique, because you can effectively uh, steer, keep the, uh, the scope central in the lumen, and then with rotation and backwards tip movement, you can help to concertina the sigmoid back on itself to keep it straight and reduce the risk of looping. If loops do occur, such as in this situation where there's an end spiral loop shown on the scope guide imager, you can see that as the, the straightening withdrawal, which is clockwise twist and withdrawal is applied, the endo cuff engages and anchors the tip of the scope, enabling the, that straightening of the scope. And of course, once the sigmoid is straight, the rest of the procedure becomes very straightforward. There is uh, a downside, uh, of course, to having the cuff which is that it does slightly increase the luminal diameter at the tip, increasing fr frictional resistance. So there is a small percentage of patients that are not suitable for use with the cuff. And these are patients with a fixed or angulated sigmoid due to severe diverticulosis or adhesions. In that situation, you have to stop and take the cuff off. But that's a rare event only occurring in about 4% of patients. Um, the real advantage of the endocuff comes during the withdrawal phase when the arms engage and we get this flattening of the fold, in the right colon, you can angle into the inside bend, say at the hepatic flexure to open up the views. And in the left colon, which is narrower, all the arms can engage and give you this panoramic view, allowing you to stay in the midline in the center of the lumen, uh, doing a controlled steady withdrawal um, and uh, getting optimal views throughout the left colon. It also aids in washing and suctioning because the arms help to stop the mucosa from getting sucked into the biopsy channel. And it also stabilizes the tip of the scope um, during polypectomy, which is important not just when you're removing a large polyp like this, but also for small polyps. And again, makes the process of polypect polypectomy more efficient and creates this quicker, more effective withdrawal. Here's some data. The biggest study is the adenoma study uh, with my co-lead author, um, Colin Reese from, from Newcastle um, and the Northern Regional Endoscopy Group. Uh, it was a randomized trial of endocuff versus standard colonoscopy, seven UK centers, over 1,700 patients. And the bottom line was that particularly in bowel cancer screening uh, patients where you have a polyp-enriched group, there were significant increases in ADR of over 10% uh, and increase overall. Um, the endocuff came off in 4%, uh, no adverse outcomes apart from slightly increased anal discomfort. But this quicker um, insertion time also with the cuff, presumably because loop management and passage through the sigmoid became was easier. Uh, it's not just in the UK. This is a study from uh, America, which has looked at the efficiency of withdrawal of the endocuff, um, which showing that inspection time significantly reduced compared to standard colonoscopy, despite the fact that adenoma detection and the ADR significantly higher, 61% compared to 52%. So showing that using the cuff makes the procedure more efficient. Talking of efficiency, do we need a new quality metric? And of course, about 20% of colorectal cancers probably originate from sessile serrated adenomas or polyps. So they are not included in the ADR. Perhaps we need a more all encompassing um, quality metric, which also involves time and gives you, gives you an efficiency score. So we've proposed the SP6 or number of significant polyps removed within a six minute period. 
And in a study recently published in GI endoscopy, the DETECT study, we performed a randomized tandem study of endocuff vision assisted colonoscopy versus cap assisted colonoscopy, showing a lower miss rate for endos endocuff vision colonoscopy, but also a three times, almost three times more efficient uh, process with the SB6 being 0.64 compared to 0.23 with the cap. Moving on, uh, I wanted to just mention a few things about uh, complex colorectal polyps. Um, here's a, a video of a polyp which was referred to me at first view, looked as though this would be endoscopically resectable. Uh, it's in the cecum, but separate from the appendix orifice and the ileocecal valve. But this is where the advanced imaging really comes into its own. We need to be careful with our very precise optical diagnosis of complex polyps, spending time to wash the lesion, to examine the entirety of the lesion, and really scrutinizing it using all of the new technology that we, we have available. Um, most of this polyp is entirely benign, uh, but when we look further along the polyp, you can see there is an area of depression, and this lesion is morphologically is a Paris 2A plus 2C lesion. Look more closely with narrowband imaging and you can see complete disruption of the crypt structures. And this is an area of deep submucosal invasion, a nice type three lesion and is not suitable for endoscopic excision. So the reason that precise uh, diagnosis is important is that we can then make a correct decision about therapy. And another change which is coming in, which has been partly driven by COVID, is the ability to link electronically and look at that information um, from the diagnostic procedure in combination with knowledge about the patient, the patient's situation, and discuss a treatment plan based on the polyp multidisciplinary meeting, where we might have input from surgeons, from nursing, nursing colleagues, radiologists, all of whom can add towards the decision making. And with these remote platforms that we've developed uh, in the COVID era, this becomes much easier and actually more effective. If you can get that sweet spot between the patient wishes, the patient's comorbidity, polyp characteristics, you can really develop an effective treatment plan. As there are a lot of options now for how we should treat these patients, both endoscopic, surgical and hybrid procedures. Endoscopically, for instance, we can, for very benign lesions, for perhaps in an elderly comorbid patient, piecemeal coal EMR is a good option because it's almost risk-free. Whereas for more complicated lesions, which may contain cancer, ESD or full fitness tissue resection um, becomes necessary. But it's a matter of getting the right technique uh, for the right patient. Just a mention about piecemeal EM, EMR, uh, going forward to the future with ESD and full thickness techniques, is piecemeal EMR still going to be used? Well, I think it is because it's so technically easy. And we know now how to perform a good piecemeal EMR, avoiding bridges, working sequentially across the lesion, taking a normal cuff of tissue at the edge of the, of the polyp, and then thermal ablation around the margins and across any intersecting areas of prominent submucosa to create a clean base um, with uh, reducing, significantly reducing the risk of, of recurrence. Recurrence previously has been 20 to 30%, which is perhaps too high and is a good argument for performing ESD. But with these adjunct measures burning around the edges and across the top and being careful with the piecemeal excision, um, it's been shown that we can reduce recurrence right back probably below 5%. So I think um, with good technique, piecemeal EMR will continue to uh, be uh, in our armamentorium. But of course, ESD is, is a very a persuasive argument because we get on-block excision, optimal histology. If it's an R0 resection, no local recurrence. And there are, are many different devices available. They have different modalities such as needle, knife, blade, or scissor type cutting um, devices. Uh, we can use different types of thermal energy such as um, standard monopolar electroquartery 
or bipolar uh, electric artery, microwave coagulation. Um, and many of the current devices combine injection with uh, both the ability for hemostasis and for cutting. But the downside with ESD is that it's technically difficult, time consuming. There is a risk of complication. And of course, it's not as available um, in the West as it has been in, in the East, though gradually uh, availability is improving. The big issue really is this lack of triangulation, the ability to separate tissue and see clearly the dissecting plane. And there is a way around this in the rectum, which is used to use a transanal port so that we can use retractors. And this works very effectively uh, to speed up the resection and really give good visualization towards this cutting plane with dynamic retraction. In the colon, it's more difficult because access is more, more difficult, but ingenious techniques have been developed to everything from a lead weight through to a spring, clip and line, or even magnet controlled. But possibly the most effective and the easiest is simple rubber band retraction using two clips and a rubber band in between with the second clip attached to the opposite bow wall, allowing retraction and visualization of the cutting plane. And the group from Leon have pioneered this technique in the West and have good results um, with higher on block resection rates and lower complication rates. I think I'm out of time. So I'm going to conclude by saying uh, we are moving from the era of quality to the era of efficiency. Um, and we need new metrics such as SP6 to do that. Um, we need to be able to detect all of the pathology which is there in the colon and the endocuff enables that and is a major advance. Um, we have all the advanced imaging capability which we've heard about in the EVIS X1 system and we're yet to see how that will impact dramatically on our uh, colorectal practice but I'm sure it will and all of this adds up to careful decision making uh, at that polyp MDM to give the right advice about definitive minimally invasive therapy. And there are a lot of different options and it's getting the right procedure with the patient um, in the right situation. Um, all of this adds up to improved long-term cancer prevention and I'm sure we will do that. And of course, AI will allow us to punctuate and guide that process by telling us a multitude of things from polyp detection. We're already seeing early polyp detection uh, uh, devices uh, but things, simple things such as the quality of the bowel preparation, whether we accurately photo documented the cecum, uh, the time of the withdrawal and the insertion, the amount of mucosa seen, and of course, optical diagnosis of polyps and advanced cancers. So I think um, the future is very bright. There are a lot of new developments, um, but colonoscopy is here to stay for the foreseeable future. Thank you for your, your time. Okay, Brian, thank you very much for this excellent talk. There was one, before we go on, one very specific question coming in because uh, uh, somebody from the audience was watching your endocuff video very closely and he had the impression that the peripheral view was a little bit obstructed. And the question is whether this is sometimes a problem. Um, uh, no, I'd, I'd actually say uh, the opposite, really, because the, the arms are opening out the field of view and they're enhancing the peripheral view. Um, I think he, he, that might be referring to the odd occasion when you're in a very narrowed part of the colon where the arms deflect completely forward. But actually, that's, that's a very rare event uh, that, that occurs. And the majority of the times, the arms are sort of partially deployed at 90 degrees. Um, and even though the tip of the cuff is in the field of view, it's enhancing the view. And as you gradually pull back, the view ahead of you is improved as the, as the arms of the cuff slip backwards, uh, opening out the, the, the field of view. So I don't think that's an issue. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Brian. And we now go on to the next lecture. You already alluded to artificial intelligence and we'll hear, we'll hear further details from Mr. Sosa from Olympus. Thank you, Professor Roche. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. 
My name is Alejandro Sosa, and I am Product Manager for Artificial Intelligence Products in GI at Olympus. Professor Bergman has already mentioned in his talk the importance of AI in GI. I want to dedicate this talk to provide a short overview of what we have achieved so far using machine learning in gastroenterology, and based on that, to explore the potential that artificial intelligence applications have on our profession. Given the nature of video endoscopy, there were several technical challenges to overcome. Thanks to the new generation of high-performance hardware and processing tools, we could finally meet those challenges and start providing powerful tools for real-time support in endoscopy using artificial intelligence. The beauty of artificial intelligence is that it provides a comprehensive and easy-to-use framework that allows the use of machines to provide support to endoscopies in crucial times. In general, we can use AI to accomplish some of the main objectives in endoscopy. For example, it can help us to increase adenoma detection rates. It can provide a systematic approach to ensure high quality standards. It can support the detection of lesions and even to make imaging biopsies. It can speed up the learning curve of young endoscopies. Specifically, it has the potential to be used in many different applications. For example, in lesion detection, tracking or characterization, in mapping the visualized tissue to ensure maximum coverage, a condition for achieving excellence in endoscopy. It could even support biopsy guidance, therapy recommendation, and therapy evaluation. Also beyond imaging, we have the potential of improving processes using artificial intelligence. For example, pre-populating reports that just needs to be validated by physicians for completing the documentation and notification to the agencies or for optimizing the agenda and the workflow. The system knows already that certain people need more time for the procedure, so it would be great if it can consider automatically to provide appropriate appointments for those people. Or the typical example, we all know that most of the men usually don't show up for a screening if there's an important football match that day. So the system can automate the process and deny appointments for men that day. Recently, we have seen several publications showing these potentials and even validating some of them. That is important. With this input, the societies are getting more evidence and can introduce new directives that will push artificial intelligence even harder. As well as the reimbursement associated with it, artificial intelligence promised them to be a real game changer in endoscopy. As you know, in Olympus, we are working in the field of AI and are launching our own platform for hosting and running applications powered by artificial intelligence in this show. After in the introduction of great features like EDO, TXI, and RDI, CAD-E is the fourth innovation pillar of our newest endoscopy system, Evictus one which has a phenomenal speed and virtually a real-time response without any annoying relays. At the same time, it is very robust and also very silent accomplishing the requirements of the endoscopic rooms. As we have said, AI can provide several advantages to the endoscopy practice. Let us take our endo 8 cat e system as an example to check some of the main adventures of implementing AI in endoscopy. The most important benefit is that it has the potential to increase the number of detected colorectal polyps and malignant neoplasms. As we all know, there's a positive correlation between an increase in detection rates and the reduction of CRC incidence. Artificial intelligence can contribute to the overall improvement of outcomes irrespective of operator experience. Potentially, higher overall quality in colonoscopy can be achieved through standardization and objectivity of the performance levels of all positions. Since AI is the hype of the moment, it helps to increase the reputation of those facilities that have implemented it, potentially attracting more patients. Comparable results 
irrespective of expertise, may improve long-term cost effectiveness of CRC screening programs. In conclusion, implementing AI in endoscopy has potentially many advantages and benefits for everybody. I'm convinced that with the positive development that we have seen so far, the full potential of AI in endoscopy, both for imaging and also for non image applications, is very promising. Thank you very much. One. Okay, thank you very much for these uh, prospects of uh, virtual endoscopy, also with the Olympus system. Um, you mentioned um, AI being the latest hype. So maybe I can direct the question to Brian, um, who seems to be, as I happen to be, a fan of mechanical devices like Endocuff. So, so for the future, is it complementary? So, so the, the requirement, uh, for example, in a screening system is to have both mechanical plus AI, or uh, where do we go? It's also cost issue, et cetera. Yes, I mean, as Jacques pointed out, um, the operator is still crucially important, even with AI in place. You have to create the image uh, which contains the polyp for the AI to pick up the polyp so that the, the technical ability to, to manipulate the scope and to create um, a view which in the colon gives you as close to 100% of mucosal visualization as possible is still crucial. But I think the two run in parallel. So the cuff enhances that mucosal, mucosal exposure and is then complementary to any AI device, which is going to highlight a polyp, uh, which you, your brain may not recognize as a polyp, and also give you that crucial optical diagnosis of what the polyp is. Yes, but you mean, uh, you know, uh, if we are talking about visions, you know, that the, the round view colonoscopes have vanished, but maybe they can come back because artificial intelligence uh, compensates for the inability of the human brain to properly utilize these scopes. It, that's, it's possible when AI controls the scope, but at the moment, as it's a human operator familiar with a certain view, the AI is tailored around that basic uh, platform, that basic structure. If you change the platform and have a mechanical um, insertion device, if that's possible in the future, then yes, it could all be done automatically, potentially. We might be redundant, Thomas, but not, 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 in, the, not in the near future anyway. Okay, uh, speaking about, you know, finally needing both in large screening programs, we have to discuss about the costs so in very few European countries, you can probably increase colonoscopy reimbursement, saying that I need an AI which costs so and so much and I need endocuff. So how is it in the UK? Are there uh, higher reimbursement rates on the horizon? Uh, well, obviously we have a, uh, the National Health Service, so the, the cost is, is the cost. But what we're looking for is this, and this is why I was making in my presentation, emphasizing efficiency, we need to be showing that we are performing a really, really high quality examination um, with effective uh, lesion detection and effective uh, removal of polyp so that we are fulfilling our aim of colon cancer prevention. And I think there's much more of a spotlight now on not, not just, you know, do the indications for colonoscopy, for instance, we have new surveillance guidelines for polyp follow-up. And the way we do colonoscopy is much more um, under the spotlight. And that's why I think this efficiency metric will be useful going forward, comparing different devices uh, and different quality of operator. Um, but at the moment, we're in, a, in an odd situation because of COVID. We're trying to recover services very rapidly. But in the process of that recovery, I think we need to really know that when we're bringing a patient into the hospital, putting them through a bowel preparation, we're going to give the absolute uh, you know, high quality examination, which is going to protect them well into the future. Um, and that, that new data, which I presented, does show that if you have a high quality examination, it does protect people um, significantly more than a low, low quality operator. Okay, this was almost a conclusion, Brian. Thank you very much. So I can only um, add that I'm very grateful for the two presentations I have uh, 
two recommendations for everybody. First of all, Jacques Bergman and his group has published a very nice article about the methodological basis of AI, how to read AI studies, because there are plenty of them. And there is a second thing we should think about. You know, we keep telling people that the image gets better and mechanical devices, et cetera. So this is the super duper colonoscopy. And how would this possibly match with the other tendency we are watching, which is single use endoscopes? So I think this is a topic for another session, maybe next year. And uh, so I thank uh, everybody uh, very much for the nice session and uh, also to thank you to the audience.